Welcome back, my gentle and, of course, very modern apes, to a long overdue episode of The Library of Error. It has been quite some time since we addressed any creationist texts, um, and this is because I've been a bit busy. I've had a lot going on, working on my thesis, I've been ill, which is why for today there will probably be a bit of coughing. I've got my tea here, but that being said, I'll probably be pausing and uh, hacking up a lung every now and again. What are you gonna do? Such is, such is the season. It's not COVID-related, it's just a regular old cold, but that being said, I wanted to warn you ahead of time. So for, uh, let's reach over here and get it, to refresh your memory, on the Library of Error, in our Library of Error today, as a continuation, just bumped my thing, of um, Why Human Evolution is False, the Scientific Case for Independent Origins, Has Ape to Man Evolution Been Overturned? by our pal Standing for Truth. Now, Standing and I, mm, we are a bit on the outs right now. We are YouTube broken up as nemeses, adversaries, in, in a playful fashion, of course. And this has to do with a lot of confounding factors, but if you've been keeping up with the channel, most of them have to do with the fact that I feel that it is in a two-way street, our conversation. Uh, I will ask Standing questions. He will, in turn, ask me questions. I will answer them and ask the same questions again. He will ask more questions, never at any point during that exchange actually answering the, the questions that I've posed to him, some of the bigger problems that I see with young earth creationism. He's not offering me that respect, that dignity of a two-way conversation, and because of that, I'm not doing any more video responses to his YouTube channel. That being said, I did say I was going to be finishing this book review, and I'm going to. So from here on out, I am just going to be covering what is within this book with regard to Standing for Truth. And once we're done with this book, we'll probably be done with Standing, I would imagine, just in, ca just in case he does actually answer the question, I'm, the questions that I post to him, I'm, I'm kind of leaving that open. I'm, I'm certainly willing to discuss with him if he does answer the questions, but as many folks have said in the comments, I don't see that happening, and neither does anyone else. So, allow me to uh, kind of segue you back in. When we previously had left off on this text, we were discussing the chapter called Introduction, Ape to Man Evolution. Now, this chapter um, was three pages long with large font. In case you're forgetting kind of the, the size of font we're dealing with. I do have it annotated. Thank God, um, because it's, it's actually been quite some time since I've actually uh, peeled back the layers. Creationists have layers of this, of this text. It is in all color, of course, if you'll remember, I did spring for the color copy. Which leads us into chapter two, humans or pre-humans, question mark, with this cribbed picture from the uh, Smithsonian Human Origins page. I, I very much like the work that was done with these um, reproductions of some of our better known hominins. Now, if you'll also remember, Standing did indeed give me permission to read from this book. He has not revoked that permission, so we are operating under the still existing agreement that I can review and read this book. So let's jump right in, shall we? What do we see in the present? We observe a great diversity of ape forms. We also observe a great diversity of human forms we're really starting strong. I see. <laughs> oh, he's giving me the black one. He's going to kill me. This man is going to kill me. Indirectly, of course. Standing has, in the past, already kind of copped to the fact that he does accept that humans are taxonomically apes, and this is because he can't present a reason as to why we shouldn't be apes. So th this is a bit out of date. We'll go ahead and just give him a pass anytime he says that humans aren't apes. I think he means it more in a colloquial, bucking the status quo, conventional science kind of way anyways. But for the record, the author of this text, Why Human Evolution is False, Has Ape to Man Evolution Been Overturned, does indeed accept that humans are physically, that is to say morphologically, physiologically, etc., apes. So we'll, we'll be giving him a pass there. We see this the same type of variation in the fossil record. As a matter of fact, we find it to be even more diverse. I don't know if that is necessarily the case. Certainly the Miocene apes, 
Uh, but that isn't always the case with every single the kind of tax or lineage that we're looking at. It and diversity doesn't necessarily increase as you go backwards in time. It depends on the time period you're looking at and the species that you're tracing backwards. Although we see such a great assortment in both the past and the present, it is not challenging to distinguish ape bones from human bones if the skeletons are substantially intact and not too fragmented. If this were the case, then the author of this text, a one standing for truth, would be able to present the criteria by which he would distinguish a human kind from an ape kind, or an ashalpithecine kind, as he, as he puts, as he tends to put it. But I can tell you, Having read this book in its entirety, he does no such thing. There is no list of criteria. There is vague gesturing at certain species. Typically, with with this gang of creationists, it will be uh, Australopithecines are a group, and then genus Homo is a group, except for Australopithecus sediba and Homo habilis, both of which they think are too problematic. I've covered in in absolutely nauseating detail why Australopithecus sediba and Homo habilis are valid organisms, and you can find that link in the description because it is very long and I'm, I'm not going to rehash it here. A lot of the stuff now where we are in this book is going to be me saying, hey, I've covered that. Here's the link in the description. Um, but there will be some new, some new and novel things. We will also cover many of the so-called human ancestors as well as the purported transitional forms, including the ape examples such as the Australopithecines. He does bold Australopithecines and he spells it right. I like that. No Australopithecines in this book. By the time you finish this book, you will see that the commonly assumed pre-humans such as Homo naledi, Homo erectus, Homo floresiensis, and Homo neanderthal were not pre-human. So a small critique, it would be Neanderthalensis if we're actually using the correct uh, nomenclature for these hominins. And typically, as I'm sure everyone who took a high school biology class will know, when you write out a species name, uh, the way that you're going to want to actually write that out, as in Homo floresiensis right here, is going to be in italics with the first word capitalized at the beginning and the second word in all lowercase. Um, he does not get that right. I don't think a single time in this book that I'm remembering. Maybe he does. I could I could get it wrong. Uh, their team SFT was kind of involved in this book in general, so it could be that maybe some of the members are more adept at others than others at um, remembering how to actually write down binomial nomenclature species. But we'll see, won't we? <laughs> They were all members of the human species. The anomalous features often regarded as primitive or transitional were the result of accelerated ge genetic degradation due to the post fabal isolation. This ripple effect, or the ripple effect rather, of this isolation was prolonged inbreeding. Uh, then he links a paper called The Genetic Cost of Neanderthal Intro Introgression, which essentially just talks about the nature of the founder effect with Neanderthals. If you forget from your biology time, time in biology, the founder effect is essentially the the genetic factor that comes into play, genetic mechanism, I suppose you would say, that comes into play when a small population moves and founds a new habitat for said population. Usually this is um, after some kind of radiation, maybe a new geographic barrier um, creating geographic isolation. And because of that, you have a small isolated pocket of the original population somewhere new, and that population is going to be predisposed to more inbreeding because they've they've lost a lot of their genetic pool and that resulting inbreeding is called the founder effect so that's just a little, a little free biology lesson for you guys out there there exists an unstoppable crisis for those that believe in universal common ancestry as a matter of fact there exist numerous problems for believers in human evolution believers there exist numerous problems for believers in the globe earth the globe heads, as it were. Hmm. Genetic entropy is something that he mentions a lot in this book. Genetic entropy is really, really stupid. We're not going to be touching very much on genetic entropy. I feel very comfortable hand-waving it, and one of my primary reasons for this is because one of the main creationist scientists who's proposing genetic entropy as a thing is John Sanford. John Sanford has an employee, Sal Cordova, who sometimes appears on the author of this book's YouTube channel. I know Sal personally. He really is a great guy, 
But I think he's very, very grossly incorrect uh, in supporting genetic entropy as an idea, primarily because at Sal's own admission, you do have to change the definition of fitness in order to get genetic entropy to work. So you may encounter a creationist out in the wild who will say, ah, things are only getting worse because of the fall. This is exemplified by um, genetic entropy, which is something that we see. And um, case in point, Scientist X supports it. Scientist X will almost invariably be John Sanford, and genetic entropy only works if you change the definition of fitness, which you can't actually do. <laughs> fitness is has been a definition just since evolutionary theory came into being with Darwin. So you, that's not really going to work. Genetic entropy is not a real thing. The biological, uh, I was going to say the biology term, but the biological term would be error catastrophe, and even even that is really not going to be a thing. So up, up a creek here with the genetic entropy. I feel comfortable hand waving it. When we see genetic entropy, um, I'm going to say genetic entropy, and I'm going to do the genetic entropy sign, and we're going to say it's like this, and then I'm going to say skip. So I'm going to be like genetic entropy, skip. Uh, another thing that he talks about here very briefly is this idea of the... Um, pathology in the human species, he links, or he very, links, I mean, he does include hyperlinks in this book, but he very consistently will reference back to that Eric Trinkhouse paper, which is an abundance of developmental anomalies and abnormalities in the Pleistocene people. I covered this in a video already as well, I'll link in the description. Essentially, what the paper says is because we find many hominin, late, late hominin remains, late hominins meaning um, Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens, with like pathology in them that is support for this genetic entropy thing according to standing, except the paper doesn't actually say that. The paper discusses a myriad of different factors that likely led to a bias towards the preservation of these abnormalities, of these pathologies in these populations, um, none of which are related to creationism in any way. So standing using and abusing papers, he will very frequently wig out on his channel and say that I'm like casting shade on him for misrepresenting the paper, but that's just what he did in this book. Uh, please review the previous video. Let me know if you think I uh, if you think I unfairly treated him there. He he genuinely just didn't refer to any of the other factors that Eric Trinkhouse mentioned. And one of my buddies actually contacted Eric Trinkhouse, and Eric Trinkhouse was not happy about the fact that creationists are using his paper. Um, for nefarious creationist means. So let us continue. <coughs> I cover many lines of, of evidence suggesting independent origins in my book, Universal or Separate Ancestry, The Biblical Model of Origins Made Easy. We will recap some of that evidence very briefly here in chapter one of this book. The major crisis for the proponents of human evolution is that of genomic degradation. That's genetic entropy skip. Unfortunately for human evolution, both ape and human genomes are degrading, blah blah blah. We, the evidence for this is overwhelmingly strong. He continues to go over that through page 18. Yeah, there's just it, one of the reasons why he's suggesting that genetic entropy is a thing is reference to this idea of near neutral deleterious mutations. That's also just not a thing fitness means that select, like your fitness is just your ability to um, reproduce essentially, or your ability to pass off these these genetics of yours to your offspring. And that's of course the definition that they, they standing in Sanford and um, uh, Sal Cordovo actually want to change. But the thing is, so he's going to reference this accumulation of general mutations. That's not actually problematic. He's going to reference these like very pocket populations of great apes today that indeed are very inbred. Inbreeding is not the same thing as genetic entropy or in biology error catastrophe. Those are two entirely different things. But either way, there's just not, he's, he's, he like gestures very strongly to the, this idea that this is a supported kind of concept in biology. It's just not though, you know, again, I, I'm going to put some links in the description for some coverage on genetic entropy just in general, but it's not, it's not something that happens. Fitness will, or sorry, selection will act on an organism 
if it possesses traits that harm its fitness. There, there's not going to be, if it's neutral, it's not going to reduce the fitness. If it's bad, it's going to reduce the fitness and selection will act. Those are the two options. And the third option I would, I suppose, would be it increases fitness and then selection acts too, but in favor. Those are the only outcomes though. You're, you're not going to get something that is bad for you that selection is like unable to see. There are no invisible genetic entropy gremlins lurking around in your genome. <laughs> um, <clears throat> man could not have evolved from an ape-like creature millions of years ago through small incremental changes. Okay, why not? <laughs> you know, first of all, these guys have a problem with the time scale, but even an old Earth creationist will, would, would have a problem with these small incremental changes. Well, why not? Which, which changes are too, are too high a hurdle? You'll find that they don't frequently gesture to specifics with these, with these, excuse me, I burped, with these kinds of things. The reason is because if they gesture to a specific, you can actually dissect that specific. Oh. And potentially prove it not to be the case. Yeah, the, the best way to create a, a foolproof worldview is to make it unfalsifiable, which is very much what creationists tend to do. <clears throat> One way to understand mutations is to look at them as typographical errors in a text. Now he's basically talking about how if you've got uh, a whole textbook like this book here, and every time you reproduce it, some of the words of some of the lettering changes, eventually you'll end up with this incomprehensible mess. You're not going to end up with Shakespeare. Well, of course not. But then again, there's no selection acting on it. So the selective pressure there would be your editor. Um, and, you know, if there were mutations that perhaps made the text better, maybe the editor would say, hey, we'll go ahead and keep those. Those are going to be super rare, but they'll be heavily selected for. Hey, that's kind of like a little analogy to evolution, isn't it? And then we got a bunch more information on genetic degradation. Proponents of human evolution point to them, meaning hominin fossils, as evidence for ape-to-man evolution. This rapid degradation is due to inbreeding, isolation, and founder effects. So inbreeding and founder effects, I don't know why those are being listed as separate things. Many of these hominin fossils clearly display anomalous pathologies. Some late hominin fossils show clear pathologies. But here's the thing about that. If we can tell that they show pathologies, wouldn't that protect the rest of them from having pathologies? Like, wouldn't that, wouldn't that mean that we can tell that the other specimens that we have don't have pathologies? Like, if I can point to something and say that it's polka-dotted, I'm also capable of pointing to things that aren't polka-dotted and saying that they're not polka-dotted, right? And, unfortunately for standing, as exemplified in Trinkhouse's paper, which he references earlier, hmm, the majority of hominin fossils, period, are not pathologic in nature. So it creates a bit of a problem for him. <clears throat> this would reveal that in the past, several isolated and inbred human populations experienced reductive evolution, devolution, he says in parentheses. As covered in the introduction chapter of this book, Dr. John Sanford and Christopher Root make an irrefutable case for this in his book, Contested Bones. Oh no, God! No, God, please, no, no, no! Yeah, so this book actually radiates a very large firmament-style dome of irreverent boneheadedness. And when you are within this dome, it's invisible, you can't see it. When you're within this dome, as I am now, you actually actively lose IQ points. This is damaging the white and gray matter in my brain actively tearing apart the neurons, piece from piece, rending the axons in twain. This is the kind of thing that I do for you people so that you can enjoy the, the busting and the absolute risk that I'm taking on your behalf. Anyways, the Standing references this piece of garbage multiple times in his own book, which is, I don't know, I, I wonder if he took if he took inspiration with the same general shape, perhaps. This book actually has rather small font, so I'm not 100%, I wish Stanley would have taken kind of more cues from, from the internal formatting of Contested Bones, which we will be going through in depth at some juncture 
but if Sandy had done that, his book would have been even shorter than it already is. So I understand why he is not doing that. Let's play a game. I'm going to pick a page at random in Contested Bones, <coughs> and we will see. Look, it's already taking effect. The dome that this thing radiates is <coughs> is actively destroying my chromosomes, um, much like a nuclear disaster would. Uh, I'm not sure I'll make it through the entire video. We'll pick we'll pick a hominin that we haven't touched on before from the beginning, and then we'll pick a. Uh, well, I want you to be able to see. Closing my eyes here, and then we'll pick a random spot on the page, a random page. We'll do this page here, the end of Homo neanderthalensis. Completely at random. Let's see how wrong it is. Let's count how many just incorrect facts that it says on page 51. Since the time of Darwin, Neanderthals have been proclaimed to the world as a separate subhuman species unworthy of the classification Homo sapiens. The way that this is being characterized is incorrect. Yes, it's being Neanderthal, Neanderthalensis has been classified as a separate species. No, it has not always been in this state of, like, uh, insult, right? This, this kind of means of debasing a Neanderthalensis, just a separate species. However, there is now compelling evidence from numerous sources that Neanderthals were fully human and should be classified as Homo sapiens. No, that's incorrect. Some people initially argued that Homo Neanderthalensis should be a subspecies of Homo sapiens. To my knowledge, and I, kind, I stay pretty up to date on this, no, that is not the reigning hypothesis. Uh, this kind of went out the window once we sequenced the genome of Neanderthals. Neanderthal anatomy is overwhelmingly modern. No, that's also false. We are three sentences in. They are three sentences in with three incorrect facts regarding the subjects of those three sentences. No, off the top of my head, Neanderthals lack a chin, they lack a prominent chin. They lack, or rather they possess an occipital bun, which is um, a sort of knobby protrusion of bone right here on the back of the skull. They have these very prominent brow ridges, very large nasal passages. The way that the zygomatics around their orbits are, are ang um, kind of, um, the way that they jut out to the side is, is significantly different from humans. They have a retromolar gap, that is to say, in their teeth, there's a gap in the back there. That was some free ASMR, and you can see how sharp my premolars and my canines are. Mm. Some people are into that. <laughs> I'm so I apologize. It's late here. I'm always doing these streams late. That's I, I really do need to knock that off. It, it puts me in a weird mood for these streams. Um, I guess they're not really streams. I keep saying they are. To me, they feel like streams. I do feel like I'm discussing with you guys directly. Hmm. Neanderthal and okay, I already did that one. The paleo community now universally concedes. No, not true. That was two in two falsehoods in a single sentence. The most notable differences are confined to the skull. That's partially true. There are probably the easily the most easily recognizable differences are, are are located in the skull. But the axial skeleton actually has plenty of of. Um, novelties to it as well. Neanderthals have these big, broad, barrel-shaped chests, for instance. Uh, their limbs are noticeably shorter than humans, anatomically modern humans. This is within um, the, the um, kind of trend that we see with Allen's rule, which is that animals tend to get more centralized as they move north so they can conserve their body heat. Um, Thomas Huxley and many contemporary paleo-experts... The paleo-experts thing... Oh my god. When, when, when the paleo experts is mentioned, the the force field pulses, and and I just start falling apart from the inside out. <laughs> Homo, uh, the the further known Neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens could be arranged into morphological continuum. Yes, kind of. I mean, you you can you typically can arrange some kind of morphologic continuum with sister species. That is typically something you can do, which argues against their separateness as a species. Not surprisingly, lumpers have insisted that Neanderthals should be reclassified as Homo sapiens. Famous sites such as the Pit of Bones of Spain show what is possible for a single population to display features characteristic of all major hominid species in the genus Homo. Yes, kind of. Again, there's this is a half-truth. There is indeed interbreeding within closely related species, and you would expect certain traits to be these sort of weird gradients when that does happen. But the pit of bones that is referenced in Contested Bones, which we will get to one day, is horrifically covered. Um, it, it is not 
a very good recollection of this pit of bones. It's mischaracterized out the wazoo. This proves that all these people coexisted and were a part of a diverse interbreeding population. If someone says this proves something and they're talking about a scientific topic, run the other direction. That should not inspire confidence. In science, we don't, science doesn't deal in absolutes, typically, unless you're math. Uh, in 2010, the sequencing of Neanderthal genome confirmed Neanderthals and Denisovans were members of our own species, Homo sapiens. They absolutely, positively did not prove that. In fact, what they proved is that because humans, anatomically modern Homo sapiens, are 99.9% .9 similar to one another, myself and any given human on the planet will maximally be that far from one another. Neanderthals being 99.7% different from humans does indeed make them like genetically distinct. Now, where you want to draw that line as a geneticist or a phylogeneticist, I would I would say, I suppose, is somewhat beyond the pale, as far as I know, beyond my pay grade, I would say, actually. I, but again, since the sequencing of the genome, I have not heard very many people suggesting that humans and Neanderthals were a part of the same species and are subspecies, as in Homo sapiens sapiens and Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. Neanderthal burial sites corroborate what the DNA evidence is showing. Homo sapiens and Neanderthals lived together in the same communities, intermarried, worked together, and were buried together. No. No, it does not prove that that is what was happening consistently. Finally, archaeological evidence recovered over the last few decades has refuted the myth that Neanderthals were intellectually inferior to modern humans. In conclusion, well, no, because they don't show the same technologies that um, anatomically modern humans were showing pretty much across the board no matter where you were as an anatomically modern human. Um, the Neanderthals never really mastered the art of long range weapons for hunting. That was like a, that was a pretty big one for, for, for humans, a big win, bigly win for humans. In conclusion, the evidence from paleontology, archeology, span and modern genetics all dramatically confirmed that the Neanderthal people were in every respect full humans. Neanderthal is us. Random page. Every sentence had something wrong with it, except I think like two. And that was like a 20 sentence page. So we don't like contested bones. And by we, I mean conventional science. So let us continue. Genetic degradation, that's genetic entropy. Skip. The book Contested Bones is a must read for anyone interested in an incredibly detailed explanation of each of the many so-called pre-humans evolutionists point to as evidence for their belief. For instance, several of the bones purported species, homo species like homo, or like a uh, hobbit, he means homo floresiensis, erectus naledi, and Neanderthal appear to demonstrate testimony of serious inbreeding and genetic deterioration. No, no, there was inbreeding in some populations of some of those species, yes, as the result of humans indeed diversifying and spreading out. When I say human in that sense, I mean members of genus Homo. But no, not all of them, not by a long shot. And as for the pathology, not by a short shot either. <laughs> like, in fact, that's that's a, the much the much uh, worse case for standing for truth is proving that pathology existed in the likes of Homo floresiensis, which I've covered at length elsewhere and we won't be doing here. Homo floresiensis is not considered by conventional science since, or has not been considered by conventional science since like 2009 to be descended from Homo erectus. Most are pointing it or are positing that it, it's positioned quite a bit earlier as a shoot off from Homo habilis or perhaps Homo rufensis. So, We'll be skipping that part as well once we get to it. More genetic degradation, let's see. Um, there were many negative factors at play in the immediate post-flood and post-battle world leading to accelerated genetic decay. Um, no, no, you also have to prove that there was a flood. That's, flood geology is not a, it's not a fun topic for creationists. Okay, John Darren, so here we go, talking about John Sanford, that was that guy I was telling you about earlier, primitive features. That apologists of ape demand evolution have pointed to in uh, Hobbit, it's Floresiensis, Homo Floresiensis, uh, Homo erectus, Homo naledi, and Homo neanderthalensis do not actually show they were less than human. They were fully human, made in the image of God. Then he shows like this kind of weird chart that's talking about 
I feel like I can't say these really like on stream. Caucasoid, mongoloid, uh, capoid, congoid, and australoid. Like weird kind of race theory phrenology style stuff. That's not to say that these are necessarily like bad terms. And I don't really like flow with the group of anthropologists that work on modern humans because I myself am not an anthropologist. I, I feel like I have to, cl to clarify this for creationists who I go up against quite frequently. I'm not an anthropologist. I study extant primates. So, you know, my, my goal is to continue to study extant primates, sometimes with relation to human evolution, but I don't plan on being a, a, a biological anthropologist, at least not currently, that's not on my track. Um, but, you know, whatever, I'm happy to clarify that as many times as need be. There has been a huge alteration in thinking amongst the experts. They are not considering a bush of life as compared to a tree of life, especially when it comes to the ape to human family tree. Not especially. We give special attention to human evolution, but human evolution is not considered any more bushy than any other lineage of, of animal. Or organism, I, sh I suppose I should say. This is because all the evidence suggests that all the presumed homo species live together at the same time. No, absolutely not. That is not the case. You you would not see Artipithecus ramidus, for example, a very early Miocene, um, early hominin of the late Miocene, living side by side with like Homo erectus. That that is not. We're talking a difference of four point four to like two million years ago. So a, a two point four million year difference. No. Uh, very, the coexistence, of course, happened. Uh, no one ever has said that it did it in, in human evolution. I suppose there, there could be fringe individuals who are saying such things, but I'll rephrase that and say, you won't find anyone within the past decade suggesting that there was an extensive coexistence among certain lineages of hominin. But there's a limit to that. These are the same people who think that dinosaurs and humans lived at the same time. So keep that in mind. <laughs> I think they've got more pressing issues than showing that, that our Artipithecus ramidus and Homo erectus lived in the same location at the same time period. These were not different species of human. They were all fully human and fit perfectly well within the biblical frame time frame of human origins. The so-called Homo variants, and then he lists them again, being a part of a large metapopulation that coexisted at the same time is undeniable. I, I'm not 100% sure how that sentence works. I'm going to read it again. The so-called homo variants being all part of a large metapopulation that coexisted at the same time are undeniable. I feel like that could be worded better. Standing, get your editor on that. The position that they were, these were all different species of homo cannot be defended. It, it, none of this is true. I have a 2017 textbook for human, human evolution right behind me um, talking about the, the hypodimes of each of these species. Yes, they are different species for a reason. We do take into account morphologic uniqueness as a means of, of uh, defining species within the paleontological record. Morphologic uniqueness combined with separation geologically is, is kind of how we do it when we're looking at paleontology, because you can't actually test the genetics. That's 100% true. But the genetics isn't always a surefire way of telling the difference between two species either, because when you compare the genetics of the Chinese and the American paddlefish that we have today, they can interbreed with one another. They are vastly different genetically. So that's not always the, and when I, I say vastly different, by paddlefish standards, by, by closely related species and hybridization standards, they're very different. So no, you can't you can't necessarily even use genetics as a surefire way. Species are weird, and they're weird because they're arbitrary. Speciation is this concept that is a human thing, right? Um, all life is just a very smudged gradient. <laughs> so fitting things into species can be a bit difficult, but we try our best because it makes it easier to understand. Uh, the evidence con is cons uh, uh, conspicuous. The evidence is conspicuous that there are no noticeable and no discernible evolutionary sequence between or within the genus Homo. Maybe I'm like, I feel like I'm drunk reading this sometimes. Like some of these sentences are constructed in very odd ways. I'm going to reread that one as well. The evidence is conspicuous that there are no noticeable and no discernible 
evolutionary sequence within the genus Homo. I think he means sequences. So the way I would phrase that would be, uh, the evidence is clear that there are no noticeable and no discernible evolutionary sequences within the genus Homo. That's how I would phrase that were I writing a bad book. The evidence fits far better within the biblical model of separate ancestry. Neanderthals, Denisovans, Hobbits, Erectus, and Naledi are all 100% human. He's presenting no reason by which to think that. There's no genetics that he's putting forward to suggest that that is the case. He doesn't actually go in depth even with Neanderthals, the ones that we actually have the genetics of, as well as Denisovans. And he's certainly not covering any of the morphology. He's kind of vaguely gesturing. That's that's what this that's what this boy does. That's how he rolls. In this final part of chapter one, I'm going to cover a few more basic examples as to why we know that human evolution, and more specifically the fossil evidence, has been thoroughly refuted. The data from paleontology, archaeology, and modern genetics all indisputably substantiate that Neanderthals were in every way fully human. Biblical creationists have always predicted this. When Neanderthal were first discovered, they were the evolutionist dream discovery. They had the proof for human evolution, or so they thought. We now know that this is not the case. We, we do get like a nice cartoon, and, <laughs> and in, <coughs> in the cartoon, Standing has um, censored the Neanderthal model so that we don't see um, his penis. This is a this is my my Christ no penis no Neanderthal penises in my Christian Minecraft server. That's that's the vibe that this is giving off. Um, he doesn't actually cover Neanderthals very much. He moves right on to Homo erectus. So again, genetically and morphologically, Neanderthals are distinct from Homo sapiens. This is always going to be true. Now, whether or not geneticists decide that that genetic distinction isn't enough to actually keep it as a separate species isn't fully yet to be seen, but I very doubt, based off of the current trajectory of the literature, that that's going to be the case. So morphologically, genetically, Homo neanderthalensis is a separate species from Homo sapiens. How about Homo erectus? Oh, interestingly enough, there are actually some neat studies um, on the, the lineages of humans and Neanderthals that do indeed show us that they're sister species and unique species at that. Because that's another interesting bit. I'm going to link an, a very good debate that one of my friends, Walker, had with Standing for Truth on this very subject. Because by Standing's logic, he's not just arguing that Homo neanderthalensis is human in the same way that some very fringe anthropologists may be arguing it. These fringe anthropologists are arguing it from a standpoint of saying, we're so similar genetically that we should be considered the same species. But standing for truth's worldview requires that Neanderthals actually come from a perfect or progen uh, progenitor couple of Homo sapiens. That means that he has to show that that is the case genetically. And since we have the genetics of Neanderthals, and they aren't showing that they come from Homo sapiens. They're showing that they are a sister group. It becomes very problematic for the likes of Standing for Truth. I will uh, link in the description that debate so that you can see how, how uh, eloquently Walker lays that out. How about Homo erectus? The Homo variants known as Homo erectus were obviously fully human individuals. These human individuals lived after the great flood of Noah. As a consequence of migration and isolation after Babel, they ended up suffering from a variety of pathologies. These pathologies were connected to inbreeding and mutation. Inbreeding is a sneak preview into where we are going genetically as a species. Genetic degradation cannot be stopped. Okay, so genetic entropy, skip. Um, there's also some like prolesitizing going on here, talking about how Jesus is gonna fix like genetic entropy. I mean, you know, it, you gotta have something legit to fix if you're gonna fix it, right? I don't think JC is gonna be uh, concerned, JC would be that concerned with the genetic entropy, um, since it's not real. But whatever. Additionally, erectus skull morphology can better be explained by reductive evolution and genetic compromise as compared to progressive or forward evolution. No. Now, standing has to make the assumption that we're comparing Homo erectus to Homo sapiens in order to make the claim that what we're seeing is reductive. And when he says reductive, he's meaning from more derived to more basal, that, that direction. The problem is... 
Homo erectus is subsequent to the likes of Homo habilis, to the likes of Australopithecus africanus and Australopithecus afarensis, who possess much more basal characteristics. That means that the likes of Homo erectus are derived, they are much more human-leaning when compared to those species. Kind of like an evolution. Another point to consider regarding Erectus was the fact that Erectus was able to sail. Then he shows a screenshot, I kid you not, of like the first Google result, like when you type something into Google and it gives you like a preview suggestion. He screen grabbed that and put that in the book. I underlined may because I think that that's a bit important. There we go for you right there. Homo erectus may have been a sailor and, and able to speak. They had bodies similar to modern humans, could make tools, and were possibly the first to cook. Now one expert is arguing that Homo erectus may have been a mariner, complete with sailing lingo. Um, okay. <laughs> Let's let us reconsider the sentence immediately preceding this picture. Another point to consider regarding Erectus was the fact that Homo Erectus was able to sail, followed by Homo Erectus may have been a mariner, as posited by one anthropologist. I hope you're seeing the disconnect here. This fact alone clearly speaks of human intellect. This goes also for the evidence implying controlled use of fire and sophisticated language. Erectus is a variant form of human. This is also indisputable. Cool, so got a gibbon here, mini mode, and as you can see, I've got some homo erectus skulls here in the back, and what we're looking at right now is specifically one of the Demonisi skulls. These are specifically known to be some of the more primitive and basal of the Homo erectus specimens. Now, I hope that when you look at this, and when you look at it in comparison to a human skull, anatomically modern, seen here, that you can see some of the differences. These are not the same species, even just using the morphology. Now, tracking backwards, the genetics aren't suggesting that these are the same species at, at all, at, in the slightest. I, I was about to say at the slightest, I'm sorry. I'm, again, it's late. Oh, I'm still so sick. Have pity. Oh. Right away though, I hope you can notice some of these differences. We've got this massive protruding brow ridge right here. Post-orbital constriction right behind the skull, which isn't necessary in the humans as much because obviously the, there's not all that much post-orbital space going on here when compared to uh, the likes of like a, I'll show you what I mean when I say post-orbital constriction. Post-orbital constriction. So, hold on, here we go, I'll show you. Just so you can see what I mean. So post-orbital constriction are going to be like right here, like in a primate skull, primate skull. Look, now I sound like, um, standing for truth, in a non-human primate skull you tend to see this constriction right behind the orbits uh, before you get to the brain case. So <laughs> this is even comparing, this is even comparing the two, talking about the constriction, but this is, yeah, okay. So this is the stuff that I was just saying with the Demony sea skull. But what we were going to get to was some of the uh, prognathism, the presence versus the absence of a chin. Both of those are very excellent points comparing the Demonisi skull to that of Homo erectus. Another one that I would point out would be the retromolar gap, which is the space behind the molars. Um, when we were looking at like the wisdom teeth, eh, the, the body of the mandible, the ramus, that is very different indeed as well. It, it, you, no, not at all. Not at all the same species. So let us get back to our book. Okay, I'm gonna leave this up because we'll probably utilize some of these easy access, some of these googly searches here in a moment. All right, what about the so-called hobbits? The technical name for hobbits is Homo floresiensis. The, the technical name, the technical name for hobbits. I wonder if Tolkien knew that. This purported pre-human was also very clearly 100% human. This is indicated by their remarkable cultural inventory, abilities to sail, and endocast scans that reveal a modern human brain. No, not a modern human brain. Some derive as derived aspects 
Their anatomy is also modern human looking. <laughs> but remember, the, the Hobbit's distinctive features are best explained by pathology. These pathologies seen in modern humans. These pathologies are seen in modern humans. He means, he's, he's talking about microcephaly and dwarfism. The small brains and small bodies are best explained by island dwarfism, inbreeding, and reductive evolution. And then he, uh, he shows another screen grab of uh, live science, with the highlighted portion being, Hobbit-like species may turn out to have simply been the remains of human suffering from genetic illness that causes the body and brain to shrink. I wonder if we look at when this was published, if we'll find it being, like, 2009 or earlier. Let's check it out. We'll look it up exactly. Okay, Hobbit-like species may turn out to have simply been... I'm glad you guys are on this journey with me. Hobbit-like species may turn out to have been... To have simply been the remains of a human. To have simply in the remains of a human suffering from, we'll see what that gets us. <coughs> Show me live science, baby. Show me the money. Show me the money, Jerry. Show me the money. Okay, let's see. Do, do, do. Let me turn out to bin. Hello? Come on. A study published in 2013. Let's see here. Looking, looking, looking. Still looking. Mm -mm -mm. This is... So this is covering simply, yeah, so this is a live science article that's more up to date than the one standing uses. And it talks about how they aren't microcephalic. What else do we know? Let's see, let's see what conclusions they reach. Was Homo floresiensis a separate species? Critics have argued that the species belong to an extinct human with microcephalia, a pathological condition characterized by a small head, short stature and intellectual disabilities. Suge <laughs> to figure it out, they did a study suggesting the small hominins didn't have microcephaly. The findings suggested Homo erectus may be an ancestor of Homo floresiensis, as Javanese specimens may of Homo erectus have these uh, uh, somewhat larger brains. Most recently, a research team used a different pathological argument to suggest that it wasn't a distinct species, arguing that Down syndrome, PNAS argue, or letter arguing that this was not the case because it lacks the distinct Down syndrome jaw structure. Study published containing 380 skull and dental features. Indeed, a distinct species. Given that the Hobbit lived in Asia but didn't evolve from Homo erectus, according to this study. So, yeah, so this, even this live science article, which is more up-to-date, evidently, than the one that Standing used, came to the conclusion that Standing for Truth in his book, published in this year of our Lord 2020, was incorrect on every single point, and it was also a live, he couldn't even use the most up-to-date live science article. Awesome. I love that. I just, I love that. <clears throat> and by love, I mean hate. Defenders of human evolution will frequently point to smaller brain sizes as evidence for progressive evolution. You'll see them line up a variety of skulls that depict an evolutionary progression from smallest to biggest brain. This is to provoke a positive reaction from the public. It's to help you understand what's going on. I, I also want to note very quickly, the reason why we were looking at that live science article isn't because live science is a good source to go to. It was to see if Standing was using that live science article. In other videos, I've gone much more in depth on the nature of Homo floresiensis and why it's likely that this is a distinct species that is an offshoot of the likes of Homo habilis or perhaps Homo rudolfensis. I've done that in other videos whose links you can find in the description. And that's where they'll that's where they'll be, so you can kind of appreciate that. I'm not going to go through it again, just because 
it's tread ground and I've, I feel very happy, very comfortable with the, the job that I've done previously on that. This is another form of reductive evolution. So what he's arguing here is that because scientists typically line up the skulls going from small brain case to big brain, brain case size, Homo floresiensis is problematic because it has a small brain case size. <coughs> That's ridiculous and silly. The reason, of course, being we know that Homo floresiensis suffered from island dwarfism, and we find dwarf elephants on that same island of Flores, and we also find island gigantism in some of the um, some of the rats, some of our, our rodent populations, and some of the storks that we find there. So the interesting bit about that being island dwarfism makes things small. The really interesting thing about Homo floresiensis is that it has basal characteristics outside of that small brain case size that it's carried over from its more basal relatives. If it certainly was the the just a, a, a afflicted Homo sapiens, where's the chin? Why does it have big orbits or a larger brow ridge rather? Why is it? Why do its limb proportions match more basal specimens? And all of these are interesting questions. Additionally, for those of you who don't know, there have been studies that have checked off pathology. Pathology is not what's afflicting uh, LB1 and the other specimens at a Liangbo cave. Once again, this is all evolution in reverse. No, it's island dwarfism. That's just a factor of evolution. This is all expected and predicted in the biblical post Babel flood model. No, in order for something to be predicted, the model has to be in place prior to the finding. No one was saying that, like, no creationists were saying that we should expect these, these degraded Homo sapiens, like, prior to Nathaniel Jensen, really. And Nathaniel Jensen was like, on the scene 2015, well, maybe a little bit earlier, maybe like 2012, but like a lot of these hominids were found in like 2005 and earlier, so wouldn't that be a retrodiction? Seems like it might be. The evolutionary community is now desperate for evidence. They're searching far and wide, and as you can see here, they're having very little luck finding any real evidence for human evolution. They now have looked to Australopithecus sediba and Homo habilis as what they call perfect transitional forms. I like to think that he's pulled that from my video. The actual evidence is quite the contrary. Sediba and Habilis have both been discredited. I put three question marks on that one as if to say, huh? That's all, that uh, um, uh, Tim Allen sound from Home Improvement. Huh? Says who? Standing? Ooh, interestingly, you'll find that his source for this is also contested bones. Desperate evolutionists who want so badly to hold on to their evolutionary philosophy still hold on to these fossils as evidence for human evolution. But any free thinker can see that both Sediba and Habilis are characteristic examples of what happens when you piece together a so-called species based on a jumble of mixed bones. They are artificial species. They are a mixture of human and non-human bones. When they find a bone they cannot easily classify or figure out what it belongs to, they toss it into the Sediba and or Habilis species. This is, an, this is essentially a ghost taxon. He presents nothing to support that in this text. And we're trying to assess this text as uh, in isolation, like as its own entity. So it's not good that the, he's not covering that more in depth. It's to the contrary, quite bad. He's just kind of asserting it with nothing to back it up. I've also covered Standing's uh, extra textual um, reasons as to why he thinks that it's an artificial species. They all come from contested bones. In case you're curious, I go through it in, again, nauseating detail in videos whose links you can find in the description. <coughs> Needless to say, no, they're not artificial species, not in the slightest. In fact, we, we find the likes of Australopithecus sediba in partial articulation, in blocks, in pits, away from the other organisms that we find in those pits, and also as the only primate outside of a single um, piece of a, of a ancient baboon. Very interesting. No other hominins in, in, that, uh, in that find, in the Malapa site. Is this done intentional? Intentionally, I think he means? Proponents of evolution will often call the biblical creationist a conspiracy theorist when these facts, when these facts and observations are pointed out. 
This is not a conspiracy theory, since it is not at all uncommon or even unusual for paleo experts to unintentionally mix bones together. Presents no examples. I assume that he is referring to the baboon bone found with Lucy. I've covered that as well and shown why this mistake was so easy to make, because it turns out the vertebra of humans, a primate, human relatives, primates, and other more even even more basal human relatives who are also surprise, surprise, primates are very easily to mix up with primates, like baboons, <laughs> the vertebra in particular. <laughs> this one I really get a kick out of. I want to send this, just this page to all of the anthropologists and <laughs> ecologists and primatologists that I know, and you'll see why in a moment. Let me, let me hold on. Hmm. Get some tea for this one. <laughs> Sometimes these bones belong to different species. We must remember and acknowledge that the fact that there exists an incredible motivation to find the so-called transitional or in-between creature, there is a lot of money and a lot of fame at stake. And then he has the sentence, government grants demand results, with I kid you not, Obama holding out a bag of money that says evolutionary research funds and a greedy big-nosed scientist saying, sure, I'll settle that science for ya. For, for your viewing pleasure. There it is. It's, um, very tasteful, very funny, um, good, drawn well, and it's, my favorite part about it is that it's very clearly just a misappropriated climate change cartoon. I wonder if it's by the one and only Ben Garrison. It feels very Ben Garrison-y to me. You know what? I, we could just find that out. We can just find out right now. We can just go on this adventure together as a team and sort it out. Sure. I'll settle that science for you. Comic. <coughs> Apologies again. For the coffin. Mm, here it is. I, I knew it. I knew it was it was climate change related. The Liberty Alliance. But who is the author of this mysterious comic? Is it who is who is the author? No climate catastrophe. It's a lie. Dr. Patrick Moore, co-founder of Greenpeace. But who is the author of the comic? He hasn't signed his work. The Vanguard of Truth is a masked stranger in the night, it seems. <laughs> okay, well, I guess we're not going to figure out if it truly is Ben Garrison. But I do, at least we did find it. They could have used this one too. So many Obama comics. Is this one signed, maybe? Proof. Climate scientists and the media openly lie about climate change. Uh, tell that to the ecologic collapse. <coughs> well, at least we did find out that it, it was a global warming comic from the, uh, the Liberty Alliance. Thank God. The apologists of evolution have nothing left to argue with. All of their best examples of human evolution and transition from ape to man have been thoroughly refuted and discredited. I put another question mark by this because he doesn't provide any examples of debunkings in this book. He says that they're debunked, and then he says read contested bones. <laughs> Sediba and Habilis are artificial constructs that consist of a loose collection of human and ape bones. It does not matter if the evolution wants to, wants to disagree with these facts. Facts do not care if you agree or not. Facts don't care about your feelings. Um, it seems that you have a, uh, a hominin there, um, but curious, previous hominins have been shown to um, have other primate bones mixed in with them, and yet you propose that this is a valid taxon. Hmm, interesting. That's, that's my Ben Shapiro creationist impression. I hope you like it, um, because it makes me want to die. There are numerous fatal blows to human evolution, and the evidence presented in this chapter 
one here is only the beginning of it all. The mixing of human ape moans has, has happened before. This is nothing novel. We are not making things up. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Let's let's hear that one more time, and I'm going to um, I'm gonna put my I'm gonna put some effects. Government grants demand results. The apologists of evolution have nothing left to argue with. All of their best examples of human evolution and the transition from ape to man have been thoroughly debunked and discredited. Sediba and Habilis are artificial constructs that consist of a loose collection of human and a bones. It does not matter if the evolutionist wants to disagree with these facts. Facts do not care if you agree or not. There are numerous fatal blows to human evolution, and the evidence presented in chapter one here is only the beginning of it all. The mixing, the mixing of human and ape bones has happened before. This is nothing novel. We are not making things up. You know, it really reads a lot more like a conspiracy when you don't provide the examples of what you're talking about. You don't give these reasons as to why these should be artificial species. Show that these bone pits are indeed what you say they are. Uh, go into the faces themselves, actually look at the articulation, you know, rigor. As you should be able to see by now, human evolution has been comp comprehensively countered when it comes to the fossil record. There is no clear-cut sequence from ape to man. Several of you are almost certainly pondering about the Australopithecines. Good word, pondering. It still boggles my mind how any advocate of evolution could possibly think the Australopithecines are the evidence for human evolution. The absolute best examples of human evolution have been shown to be far better understood under a biblical framework. Where do these ape-like creatures fit into all this? These extinct apes were around four, three to four feet tall and share an abundance of their features with apes we see today. Need I say anything more? The Australopithecines, <laughs> the Australopithecines are nothing more than an extinct ape genus that had some distinctiveness in morphology. This is the best conclusion, and it fits impeccably well with the biblical version of ancestry. You would only reach this conclusion if you had presupposed biblical ancestry. I find it very interesting that Standing is keen on pointing out these distinct characteristics that Australopithecines share with modern apes and not touch on all the distinct characteristics that they share with modern humans and not with modern apes, suggesting perhaps mosaicism. And when I say I find it interesting, I mean I don't find it surprising at all. As we covered earlier, it appears the evidence suggests we have a greater diversity in the pre-flood world. What evidence suggests that? What, like, like, what paper do you have that suggests that diversity in this pre-flood world, and of course this would be pre-6,000 years ago, um, or I guess pre-4,400 years ago in conventional science, has had a greater diversity? It's very weird, you see, because Crisius can't even agree on which rock, that is to say, which, which layers, which geologic periods are pre versus post flood. They can't even agree on that within their own sect. So, you know, I, I understand why they're not putting any, like, peer reviewed papers out there on this kind of stuff, because they kind of have bigger problems to deal with, like the heat problem, and all of human evolution, and genetics, and the speed of flight and all of physics itself. <laughs> it's just, I, <laughs> bigger fish to fry, I suppose. And this means there was also a larger diversity of apes. This may be the only accidentally true thing in this entire text. There, there did used to be a greater diversity of apes in the Miocene period. The Miocene is actually known for its hominoid diversity. If these Australopithecines were still alive today, they would be deemed their own unique genus and yet still obviously an ape. That is also true, just humans are also apes, as Standing also says. 
The living apes today all share various sets of features with, with each other and some, with some being unique to their own genus. Yes, that's also true. Even with their distinctiveness, they are still considered apes. So are we, as you yourself admitted, standing. Another point to consider is the fact that certain isolated bones have been erroneously allocated to the australopithecines that are human. Nope, there's no support for that. There is also evidence that footprints and tools that have been improperly designated to them instead of appropriately assigned to humans. Nope, no support for that. It is also a reality that a baboon bone was wrongly assigned to Lucy for over 40 years. Truth in that, but we covered it earlier, and you can also find it covered in the link in the description. How much faith do we really have in the evolutionary community when we discover things like this? Yeah, you know, like, why would we trust the, the scientific community when, like, they used to think that Newtonian physics had it all figured out, now they're saying relativity is the thing? Like, if they keep changing their mind, then why should we trust them, you know? Same thing about the Earth, right? I mean... The Earth used to be flat, like, they used to agree on that. Um, now they're saying, like, it's a globe. It's like they keep changing their minds over and over again. They keep, you know, coming up with new reasons to say things are different now. Why should we trust them? So the, the, the most asinine point that I hear from creationists is that because science changes, we can't trust it. <laughs> yes, science corrects itself, and this is a terrific thing that the evolution community has admitted to this. And... This was a terrific thing that, like, he's, he's saying, okay, he's, he's copying to what I just said. That's good. But he's doing it in a weird way. They have admitted to numerous blunders and frauds in the past. But this was a blunder that went undetected and overlooked for years. Yes, and it also spurred a new scrutiny that went over all the fossils after it was discovered. Interesting. And no other misassignments were found. Hmm. Next time you see an article or a paper that claims to have the next big and irrefutable evidence for human evolution, just remember that they often take years to rectify their mistakes. I do think that while he doesn't, he's not saying it in the way that I mean it, I do agree with the sentiment that when you read a, a very flashy headline with regard to human evolution, whole new whole story of human evolution changed, rewritten. Wait a little bit, you never know. Very frequently those kinds of um, very flashy, cool headlines are what gets clicks. So my practice is to always just go read the actual article and see what the article says. That's probably going to give you the best idea of what's going on and how certain we are in what's being claimed within the Popsi article. So, but yeah, if anytime something brand new comes out, you want to give it a minute because it's going to receive a ton of peer review. And if it still holds after all that, well, then you've got a pretty good hypothesis now, don't you? One final important thing to acknowledge regarding the interpretations and conclusions made on these extinct apes and with fossils in general is that these reconstructions are very regularly done on extremely fragmentary evidence. The fossil evidence is often highly incomplete. These reconstructions are also always are also always done based on evolutionary assumptions. For example, paleontologists believe Lucy were locked, walked upright, so they will base their reconstructions on this primary assumption and starting point. Lucy did walk upright. She 100% just did. Yeah. She had a bull-shaped pelvis, uh, a femoral head that has an appropriate angle for fitting inside the acetabulum and holding the weight underneath the body. She had a valgus knee. She had inline big toes, um, or the halix, mostly inline, slight, maybe slightly divergent, but certainly inline enough to have made the Latoli footprints. She had a foramen magnum that was the proper position and angle to be holding the skull on top of the vertebral column. Yeah, she was bipedal. Um, don't listen to like Answers in Genesis and other crackpots who say that she wasn't, because to force Lucy into a quadrupedal position is to completely ignore basic aspects of anatomy and how things fit together. Um, if you're going to put her into a quadrupedal position, like as a knuckle walker, that's, that would be like putting an elephant into a bipedal position and suggesting that it's bipedal. Like the bones don't fit that way. They won't, it won't work. Anyways, that, that concludes chapter two. So good for us. We made it through another chapter an hour later. <coughs> I'm so sick. I actually might try to bustle through chapter three, depending on how um, robust it is. Oh, it looks pretty. Oh, God. I think this is the long one. I think this is the longest of the chapters in the entire book. Mm -hmm. No. It's one of the longest chapters. I will say that. The one that we just went over was a whopping... It's bigger than chapter one, that's for sure. But chapter two was from page 16 to page 33. So, one, two, three, four. Hold on. Oh, 
hold on just a second. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen ish pages. I wanted to count them to be sure because sometimes the way that this is printed is a little bit weird. Um, like, I don't know that you would really 100% count this like as a page, this one right here too, um, just because the picture makes up so much of it. Also, I'm bad at math and it's late and I didn't want to say something dumb. <laughs> um, yeah, so short, short, short chapter, but not as short as the three page chapter. So you know, we're good on that. Thank you for joining me on this journey. We will be covering chapter three shortly and I do hope you continue to enjoy it. It has been uh, approximately two and a half weeks, almost three weeks since Standing got my question list. Still no answers. Standing, I await your response. I do enjoy these conversations. <coughs> but interestingly enough, my audience doesn't seem to enjoy it as much. So I am more than happy to continue onward with our more scientific topics as we continue this sort of transition into being um, the, the channel that I want this to be. So <laughs>